We must be honest about the foundations of the political and economic systems we call America. I love America because of her potential, but I know that America will never even get close to being a more perfect nation until we are honest about the politics of rejection. I want to tell you about some of the leaders who are building the Poor People's Campaign. Callie Greer from Selma, Alabama, who had to bury her daughter, Venus, because she didn't have health care. I'm here today to share my daughter's Venus's story. Venus discovered a small lump in her breast and she wasn't insured. Venus had to be approved for every prescription and every piece of medical equipment that she needed. I'm standing here today in solidarity with the Poor People's Campaign because no one should have to bury their child in America because they don't have health care insurance. I'm 46 years old. I've lived in poverty here in West Virginia every day of my life. And I'm working. I am working poor with a bachelor's degree. I'm doing the best I can with what I have. I'm a second generation fast food worker and I've experienced the cycle of poverty firsthand. Growing up, I watched my mother endure long hours of back-breaking labor, doing everything she could to feed me and my sisters. My employer barely pays me enough to pay rent and utilities, let alone with the medical expenses with my mother. I worked 41 years in the coal mines. I have black lung, and it's just unfathomable what these poor coal miners That's right. have to go through in order to get what they have worked for and deserve. I'm a Vietnam veteran. My only chance of going to college was joining the Army. It was one thing to know that you didn't have water and you couldn't afford your water. It's a whole nother to find out that they shut off your entire community and none of you matter. But when I lost my housing, health care, and income all at the same time, I was terrified, panicked. Hi, my name is Pamela Rose. I'm from Downs County, Alabama. And I live in a mobile home with my two kids. <laughs> and I got raw sewage. I don't have no, no money on power. And I had to travel back and forth to Birmingham to take my daughter with the CPAP machine. Don't have a car and don't have no way to take her. This is the largest encampment in Aberdeen. There's about a thousand people in a town of 16,000 who are homeless. In my community, we were all shut off for the day because none of us could afford our water bills. In the past, my family wasn't able to afford electricity in the winter. It was very hard on all of us. This wall. This is sin of the highest order. When there are 38 million poor children, when 60% of African Americans are poor, when 65% of Latinx are poor, when 40% of Asians are poor, when there are 67 million poor white people, we must say, this is not right. And it's gone on far too long And we won't be silent anymore Our brothers and sisters are sleeping on the streets For a country this rich to have so many people poor It's immoral and it's wrong Our backs are against the wall and we got no choice but to push <laughs> We lift our voices for justice, we put our bodies on the line for mercy, and together we will proclaim liberty throughout the land for the enslaved, for the poor, and for us all. Yeah. Yeah. Follow that breaking news in Albany where a large group of protesters have moved into the street. Washington Avenue between City Hall and Lark Street closed down. Protesters with the Poor People's Campaign of Indiana. Two o'clock on the East Coast. Two o'clock in the middle, two o'clock on the west close. A wave, and the historians tell us it's never happened before. Our communities, Muslim communities, who have joined the Poor People's Campaign, you can count on us. 
Our democracy is in trouble. Our democracy is in trouble. And we come to demand. And we come to demand. Second warning. Because it's crucial that we make ourselves heard. No one is listening. We write letters, we make calls. No one is listening. So we gotta make our, find a way to make ourselves heard. We are the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. And we are here. We are poor. We are clergy. And we're here to say to our nation's capital and to the highest court in this land, that everybody has a right to live. Everybody has a right to learn. Everybody has a right to love. Everybody has a right to living wages. Everybody has a right to vote. Everybody has a right to thrive, to thrive in this society. Everybody say, ah! Oh! I believe that we will win. I believe that we will win. I believe that we will win. He don't fire and he taught us how to poor and their clergy. We read Article 6 of the Kentucky State Constitution that says we have a right to free assembly. We are demanding that we stop the war on our poor. We demand the right to vote. The formally you need to cease and desist immediately or you'll be arrested. There will be a movement that will break through the con and bring people together to save the heart and the soul of this democracy and this world. Well, 2018 was the 50th year, and the nation is finally beginning to see what's been happening all the time. What we see now is not new, it is, a, is, a, it is the iconography of a too often repeated reality in the American process. Dr. King said that the bourbon class has always sown division between white, black, and brown people in this country to keep them from forming fusion coalition that can change the electorate. We need moral political leadership that will challenge the works of racism, the divide and conquer strategies designed to pit people against one another, and the policies that have disparate impact on black and brown people and even white people. Systemic racism is not just against black people, it is an assault on democracy itself. <laughs> racism. It's not just words. Racism is voter suppression and gerrymandering. Since 2010, at least 23 states have passed racist voter suppression laws, including racist gerrymandering and redistricting laws to make it harder to register, reduced early voting, purged voters from the poll, and required restrictive forms of ID. If you want to talk about racism, let's really talk about racism. Strom Thurmond filibustered the 1957 Civil Rights Act for 24 hours, and we called him a racist. Mitch McConnell has blocked restore, restoration of the Voting Rights Act for six years and one month and 29 days, over 2,000 days. If Strom Thurmond was a racist for blocking the Civil Rights Act for 24 hours, Racism. Racism. Six million people have been disenfranchised due to felony conviction, including one in 13 adults. And this racism I'm talking about can't always be talked about from a black mouth. We need some white mouths that can lay out racism just like that. 
<laughs> Racism. 25 states have passed laws that preempt cities, mainly large block voting blocks, from adopting their own minimum wage laws. Racism is demonizing undocumented people while refusing to acknowledge that Texas, New Mexico, and California were taken from the Mexican people by a war. By a war for slave-holding territories that Henry David Thoreau and Abraham Lincoln resisted in the 19th century. The people are not crossing the border, the border crossed them. Racism, racism is demonizing undocumented immigrants who have contributed $5 trillion to the U.S. economy in the last 10 years and they paid $13 billion into Social Security without having a legal right to claim a dime of it when they get old. That's racism. Racism is the resegregation of our public schools with vouchers for private religious academies that were started by movements that resisted desegregation and labor during the civil rights movement. Racism is mass incarceration. It, racism is giving permits to corporations that refuse to respect Native American and indigenous people's land claim. Racism is at the root of the perversion of the Second Amendment that leaves weapons of war in the hands of citizens. Racism is why some still call the Affordable Care Act Obamacare instead of the Affordable Care Act. And racism is behind the President's call to overturn the 14th Amendment. See, racism is not just about words. And any party or political candidate that think if they just talk about the words, they have talked about racism, they are missing it. It is also the policy initiatives of congressional enablers who push racist policies or block policies that would address the harms of racism every day, and they may never say a racist word. Number two, we're going to get the heart of this democracy we cannot address the crisis in our democracy without talking about poor and low wealth people. And there are 140 million, and yes, this has been fact checked by the Washington Post. There are not 40 million poor people in this country. There are 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country. Here are the numbers. 39 million children, 21 million elders, 65 million men, 74 million women, 26 million black people, 38 million Latino people, 8 million Asian people, 2.1 million native people, 66 million white people, 65.8 million men. I know it's a lot of numbers. Yes, poverty and low wealth represents nearly 61% of black people and only 35% of white people. But when you look at that in raw numbers, there are 40 million more poor and low wealth white people in this country than there are black people. We need to talk about them. We cannot marginalize poverty. We cannot really racialize poverty, which Republicans and Democrats have done too often. We can't, we can't talk around it. Even as we sit in this convention hall, Pastor Cecil Williams of Glad Memorial Church is right behind this, ho this hotel. He knows the name and the faces of the people who've been served more than 80-some thousand meals at their shelter just this past year. These are more than numbers. We're talking about half of our children are poor and low wealth. The vast majority of people of color but when we disaggregate these numbers, we see that there are more poor and low wealth white women than any other demographic. Too often we talk about poverty as if it's just a black issue. But if you can't pay your light bill and your lights go off, whether you're black, white, or brown, we all black in the dark. <laughs> We 
when 62 million workers who make less than a living wage can't afford food for their family. Their children's stomachs don't growl black or white. They growl hungry. We are bothered as we should be. When a rogue racist police officer shoots an unarmed black person, we get in the street, should. We are bothered when a racist with an assault weapon shoots and kills 23 people, and we should. But somehow, we don't express the same outrage when the Mailman School of Public Policy issued a report that says 250,000 people die every year from poverty and low wealth. That's 684 people a day. Poverty is a crisis for all America. 43.5% of this nation. Silence on the issues of the needy is as bad as being loud about tax cuts for the greedy. It's not enough. And it's not enough to parrot the neoliberalism consensus that if the economy does better, we all do better. If Wall Street is better, we all do better. It's not true. And in fact, that plays into Trump's Con. Wall Street got a boost from the tax cuts this administration pushed through, but poor and low wealth, wealth people are struggling to survive. There might be a recession coming, but there are 43% of this country that's already in recession. And we have to say the word poverty. Don't you believe those folk who tell you that poor folk don't want you to say the word poverty. They just don't want you blaming them for their poverty. We need to lift up the stories of folks in Appalachia and Kansas and the Mississippi Delta and South Carolina and California. We need to hold them along the side of folks in our gentrifying cities, some who work two jobs and still sleep in their cars at night. It's not enough to talk about lifting the middle class because 140 million Americans aren't sure they'll ever get into the middle class. 43% of the nation, and many of them are the 100 million people who stayed home last time and didn't vote because they never hear their names in the public square. <laughs> thirdly, thirdly, we must embrace health care as a human right and ecological justice as centerpieces of a moral injustice, uh, agenda. Healthcare is a life issue. It's a moral issue. People are dying from the policies that, that do not uh, provide health care in the richest nation in the history of the world. And the states that refuse to expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act, you know what's interesting? Those same states are the ones that passed racist voter suppression laws after the Shelby decision in 2013. And you want to know what else is true? The majority of the people being denied health care in those states are white. So here is the ugly irony. The people who got elected through racialized voter suppression then used their power to hurt mostly poor white folk. And we have to connect these dots. If health care is a life issue, so is the health of our air, our water, our land, the health of the earth. The young people are right, climate change is a moral issue. But, so, but also, the fact that four million people in this nation can buy unleaded gas every day and can't buy unleaded water. And you can't talk about climate change and not talk about systemic racism and talk about poverty. Systemic racism and poverty intersect with ecological devastation from our, from our inner cities, from our inner cities, to Cancer Alley in Louisiana, where former plantations have become chemical plants that poison the sons and daughters of enslaved and sharecroppers and white people, and where they have over a billion dollars of acid water in a dam that they're thinking about spraying in the air. The reality is, if you are running for office nationally and you can't go by Cancer Alley, you ain't got no business on Pennsylvania Avenue. Five. Five, we must name how these moral in issues intersect with America's war economy. This is what the Poor People's Campaign is saying. Now, I know how worried people are. I see you right now shaking about challenging militarism. Believe me, I pastored for 25 years in an Air Force town. My father was a Navy man who gave first-class blood for second-class citizenship. I'm not questioning the courage and the devotion of this nation's veterans and soldiers. 
but I've seen what, what our senseless wars have done to them and their families. And I know the money that's wasted in the war economy and the lives and the land that's wasted by needed violence. And I know that the nation is in a dangerous place when you spend 15 cents on infrastructure and health care and 61 cents of every discretionary dollar on killing and war. Do you realize that we could cut military spending in half and still spend more per year than China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea combined? The issue isn't our security, it's our priority. We must make investing in life and peace a moral issue. And then number six, we must embrace a moral narrative and reject the narrow framing of religious nationalism. If you travel to the poorest counties in America, you will learn that folk don't have a lot to keep them going. Opioid addiction and alcoholism are epidemic, but people in those places cling to faith. Often it's all they have. And for too long, faith has been hijacked by those who say abortion, uh, being against a woman's right to choose, being against gay people, being for prayer, for guns, and tax cuts is a godly position. That is a heresy that is and never will be true. But, but we cannot merely call that a heresy and then refuse to lift up a moral narrative. We cannot see the moral narrative. It is too important. I want you to know that the left versus right, Democrat versus Republican, conservative versus liberal framework has allowed people to do what's wrong while we call it right. Huh? Black and health care is not the right. Being about voter suppression is not the right. And left versus right is too puny. The language is too small. It doesn't help us have the kind of moral imagination that's necessary in this moment of generational change. And we must declare no more. We need a revolution of values in public life. We need leadership that will draw on our deepest religious and constitutional tradition to fight not only for what seems achievable, but what must be our moral duty. Somebody asked me, as a Christian, am I a conservative or a liberal? I say I'm both. I say because there are 2,000 scriptures in the Bible that said the primary purpose of every nation is to care for the poor, the children, the sick, the women, and the immigrants. So to be a conservative is just to hold on to the essence of. So I want to hold on to the essence of, and I want to liberally spread it to everybody. <laughs> Don't get trapped in labels. And then seven and finally. We need fusion organizing to build a moral movement. This is not the time to turn on each other. It is the time to turn to each other. It is the time to understand that interlocking injustices require a moral fusion interlocking movement. We, when we embrace moral language, we must ask, does our policy care for the least of these? Does it lift up those who are most marginalized and dejected in our society? Does it establish justice? That is the moral question. If someone calls it socialism, then we must compel them to acknowledge that the Bible must then promote socialism. Because Jesus offered free health care to everyone and he never charged a leper a copay. It's time for us to say, if you want to have a moral debate, bring it on, baby. The Bible says that, every, that a nation will be judged by how it treats the poor and the sick and women and the immigrant. The Bible says that God makes it rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you want to call caring for folk socialism, then the Constitution is a socialist document because it calls us to promote the general welfare and to establish justice. Why are we afraid to use the language welfare when every politician swears to promote the general welfare? We can't be scared of labels. This current administration 
It's practicing, though, a kind of socialism. It's called corporate socialism. You give greed and to the greedy through tax cuts and deregulation and economic incentives and deregulating of energy companies. And they refuse to bail out communities and human beings, but they'll bail out businesses. That's called treating corporations like people and people like things. And we need political leaders who will stand up and say that helping people who are in need is a moral issue. It lines up with our deepest religious values and our deepest constitutional values. That it's not about being on the far left. Y'all stop using that language that gets you trapped. It ain't about being on the far right. It ain't about being Democrat or Republican. How dare anyone say that blocking livage wages is the right? Denying people health care is right. Some things are not about left versus right, Democrat versus Republican. It's about right versus wrong. A moral message can energize the people who feel left out, Tom, and looked over by the whole framing of the system as it is. And we've seen how it can bring people together, those people that have been pitted against one another, especially in the South. Now, I'm from the South, where many politicians support the current administration and still play the divisions of lies and racism. But my, brother, my Democrats, you all got to do a little repenting, too. Uh, how you haven't always come south with everything you have. The south is the native home of poverty. The 13 former Confederate states, 52.7 million people are poor and low income. 24, 25 million are white. 28 million are people of color. 13 million people are without insurance. The number of poor people in those 13 states is more than one third of the total number of poor people in the country. The number of poor whites in those states, 13 states, is also more than one third of the total poor white people in this country. But if you could come south, and if you win in the south, you know just 13 states gives you 170 electoral votes, and 26 senators, and 31% of the United States House, and what we learned in North Carolina is they don't fight us being together because we're weak. They fight us being together because we're strong. And any party, any party that will be willing to engage poor and low wealth black, white, and brown people across the South and energize them to vote, not just with a last minute robocall, but with real serious organizing, then it's a new day. These states aren't red states, they are unorganized states, they are underfunded states, they are states where we have found fusion coalition that are waiting to be called to higher ground. And any party that doesn't run hard and organize hard in the Deep South can't win and doesn't deserve to win. So I stop by to tell you, I stop by to say that it's time to come together around the moral message. In 2016, we had 26 presidential debates and not one hour focused on racist voter suppression and gerrymander and connected it to the harm and the hurt that's going on even among white people. Not one hour was about health care. Not one hour about living wages. Not one hour about court appointments and how they all are intersected. We can't have that anymore. We must have a movement that says we will not stop until love is maximized and justice is realized and evil is neutralized and workers are unionized and our air, water and land is sanitized and families are fortified and the dignity of all people is recognized and truth is normalized and the power of the people is mobilized and protest is no longer criminalized and the glory of the Lord is magnified. We're on the move. We're on the move now. And we are fighting we're fighting for the soul of this nation. We must challenge the lie of scarcity. We have the money. We don't have to even raise the taxes. A $15 immediate minimum wage would pay for 49 million workers. 
if we did it right now. We repeal the Trump tax cuts and establish fair taxes on wealthy corporations and Wall Street. It would generate as much as $886 billion per year. Just an annual wealth tax on the 75,000 wealthiest households could generate $275 billion a year, more than enough to put 2.5 million people to work fixing our infrastructure. If the top recipient of military contracts in 2018 that received $38 billion, if we invested $37 billion of that into building water infrastructure, we could create 940,000 jobs and provide safe drinking water to thousands of community. Scarcity is not the issue. The issue is will. And I want you to know that the same people, Senator Harris, who was here somewhere, who helped write that report back in the 60s, the same people rejecting the cries, Tom, of, against racism in this country are the same people rejecting the cries of the LGBT community. The same people who reject the cries of those who need public education and free college are the same ones who reject the cries of women who demand the right to choose. The, the, same, are the, same, the same ones who reject the cries of those who demand and desire health care, they are the same ones who reject the cries of those who are homeless. And the ones who reject the cries of those who fight for living wage, they are the same ones who reject the cries of those who suffer from ecological devastation. And at some point we must say, if they are cynical enough to be together, we better be smart enough to come together. The Bible says, there comes a time, Sister Brazil, there comes a time when the rejected, those, the stones that have been rejected, must become the chief cornerstone in building a new world. In this moment, we don't need to turn on each other and target each other. We need to turn to each other. And I bet you in this room, there's some people that's known rejection. Rejection because of your sexuality. Rejection because of who you love. Rejection because of how you're born. Rejection because of your class. Rejection because of your race. Rejection because somebody needed somebody to hate to feel good about themselves. There are people in here that known rejection. Rejection because of income. Rejection because of faith. Rejection because of the lack of faith. Rejection because somebody decided in their own ideology that they had a right, a false mandate to demean your humanity. But I want you to know today that the stones that the builders rejected are now the cornerstone of building a new America. I want you to know that when the rejected get together, we can in fact redeem America from hate and discrimination. When the rejected get together, when hands that once picked cotton join Latino hands, and then they join progressive hands, and they join revolutionary hands, and they join faith hands, and they join labor hands, and they join environmentalist hands, and they join medical hands, and they join Asian hands, and they join native hands, and they join poor hands, and they join wealthy hands with a conscience, and they join gay hands, and they join straight hands, and they join trans hands, and they join Christian hands, and they join Jewish hands, and they join Muslim hands, and they join Hindu hands, and they join Buddhist hands. When all those hands hands get together. When we join hands together, we can revive the heart of this democracy. When we join hands together, we can ensure the promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and equal protection under law for everybody, and that it will not be taken from anybody, anytime, anywhere. So together, Let's let the rejected come together. Together, this is your land. This is my land. Together, America may have never been America to us, but we swear this oath that America will be. Together, let us ensure that all children are, and people are treated with dignity. Together, let's be a nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Can I tell y'all a story? When slavery looked like it had the final word, black and white abolitionists came together and declared that every attempt to stop us only emboldens our resistance. When women didn't have the right to vote, Sojourner Truth, a black woman, hooked up with Lucretia Mott, a white woman, and they fought for it. When Jim Crow thought it had America tied up forever, black, Jewish, white, 
Christian, Muslim, gay, and straight came together in the civil rights movement. When they told me I'd never walk again, I couldn't do it in a silo. The prayer warriors came together. The deacons came together. My pharmacists came together. My therapists came together. My doctors came together. The x-ray technicians came together. And I can stand right now because when we all get together, when we all get together, when we all get together, what a day, what a day, what a day, what a day. to start. <laughs> you know, in my faith tradition, after a sermon like that, we often, oh, we, yeah, we pass the hat. <laughs> we're not going to do, we're not going to do that. But uh, what we do do is uh, we reflect in silence on what we learned. And I would ask us to take two minutes to reflect in silence on what you heard today, in particular, his admonition, and I quote, this is not the time to turn on each other. It's the time to turn to each other. I'd ask us all to take a couple minutes in silent reflection. <laughs> 